All right, good morning everyone and welcome to Finland on my behalf. My name is Mika Seitson and as, 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 as Sami said, uh, I'm his colleague and uh, I'm a trainer and also in charge of the infrastructure, infrastructure product offering at Sovelto. So we will hopefully meet with all of you in the evening at, at our offices later on. What I'm going to talk today, uh, <coughs> I'm going to talk about PKI. And uh, I've been training PKI since, since the first edition uh, that Microsoft PKI came along. I don't remember, I'm, I'm not sure whether you have been training PKI for that long. Uh, if you have, then uh, you probably remember that uh, IIS 4.0 course, uh, I think the code was 836. And at that time there were problems even with Microsoft products uh, not knowing what the other one was doing. So it was uh, IE and IIS and they were, they were kind of uh, separate products altogether. And then uh, we had to copy, copy registry keys and so on uh, to enable, for example, trust between these, these two products. I actually iterated this uh, topic and the presentation several times with uh, Sami and I was, I was wondering that uh, and suggesting that I, I might also talk about direct access but then uh, ended up with PKI and now I have a challenge uh, since I've been training PKI last, like last week. We have a, at Sovelto we have a three day our own uh, custom made course on PKI and <coughs> now what I took from that course was for example the demo environment. So it's like the end product of that course and then I have added some, some additional things. So I'm going to show, show them off uh, later <coughs> during this presentation. Just a, reminder, <coughs> just a reminder how the PKI on Microsoft environment has evolved. As I already mentioned, we started with NT option pack and that can be titled as uh, version 1.0. I was trying to <coughs> put uh, these version numbers which are in parentheses so that uh, you, uh, I was trying to ima evaluate and uh, recall how, <coughs> how large the changes were from one version to another. And as <coughs> you probably recall, uh, in Windows 2000 uh, Active Directory came along and then uh, also came, came along the uh, integration of PKI into AD. Then uh, we went along and I, I recall from, I think it was Tech at US or Tech at North America in 2006, I went to PKI pre-conference workshop at that time and I, re I remember that uh, they were saying that uh, the component of Vista that took mon most man hours was actually the rewrite of the PKI side and the crypto API. So that was, that was really huge change. And uh, now we, we have the fruits of that change so that we can actually enable the more, uh, <coughs> more secure algorithms. But we, we are still, uh, when, when we consider that, that that took place already six or seven years ago, we are still uh, uh, facing the issue of having uh, older, both older operating systems and older uh, active uh, devices in our networks. So they, they probably don't support uh, elliptic curves and elliptic curve algorithm that came along with Vista and uh, Windows 2008. Then uh, <coughs> after that we have had smaller changes. So Windows Server 2008 R2, 2012 and uh, 2012 R2, they have uh, introduced some, some features uh, which I will discuss later on during this presentation as well. But there hasn't been su su such a drastic change as, as came along uh, with uh, Windows 2000 and 2008. Just out of curiosity, how many of you are training uh, uh, Server 2012 courses? <coughs> so most of, most of you, you are familiar with all those two, two modules that, or three modules that are there. How many have been training the uh, 2821 uh, course, which was a PKI course developed by Brian Komar? Few of few of you, so you are familiar uh, with that course. And I, I recall it was was it a four-day course at that time, or was it even five, three or four? It was five. 
Yeah, it was a long course, and we were we were creating the uh, constraint constraint uh, subordination, and that that exercise took probably something like half an, uh, uh, two hours or something like that. And uh, uh, I've been actually consulting also some companies, and I've been fortunate to be able to also tell about those experiences that I have had over the years. And uh, <coughs> until now, I, I, at least here in Finland, I haven't seen even one system where they would have had the qualified subordination implemented. What, what's your take? Have you, have you seen anything any in practice or in production? No, so so that, that's something that uh, uh, we actually, on, on our three-day course that we are now having, uh, we don't, we don't include that uh, feature or, or the lab exercise at all. So <coughs> our demo environment today has a lot of servers. And uh, why it has so many servers is, is because it is the end result of the course. So during the course, what we actually implement, we implement the two-tire uh, PKI hierarchy so that uh, there is a uh, domain controller, obviously, and then there is an offline root CA, and then a enterprise CA that actually is being in implemented into this server, uh, server two. I remember, uh, I think it was last year, we actually had this course for two days initially, and uh, it was uh, uh, first, first uh, it was in, uh, implemented and uh, created for, for Microsoft partners. And then uh, last year, I remember, no, was it last year or the year before, I remember one guy actually sending email prior to the course and asking that, are we actually going to learn how to transfer the CA from one server to another? And I said, yes. And then uh, uh, I actually created the lab exercise also and realized that it's actually something like one and a half hour lab to do the, do the uh, transfer from one, one server to another. So on this environment, the uh, enterprise CA has been actually transferred from server 2 to server NN. So uh, there, the specs and the guideline that is there on the TechNet is pretty detailed and it is pretty accurate, but not 100% accurate. I, I learned it uh, in a hard way when I was preparing the exercise. And then nowadays it's, it's probably something like 10, 15 pages of uh, uh, instructions for the students. In this environment, uh, we have also OCSP, online certificate status protocol, web responder that is located on the server 03. And then there is also a, a, a forefront identity manager certificate management, uh, which is located on the server 04. And then uh, <coughs> this is kind of old environment, so all those servers are running on 2008 R2. And then uh, on, the, on the right side, we have two servers running, running 2012 R2. Uh, one of them is a direct access server, and the other one is then uh, enterprise CA. So there is no two-tire uh, setup for the, for the CAs here. And then I have uh, uh, the machine that I'm, I'm demonstrating this stuff uh, is actually an old one. We, we actually got these machines uh, with Sami, uh, this kind of Dells. Uh, I think it was, was it already five years ago? I think so, five years ago, and then uh, I actually moved over, and uh, we are also Apple Authorized Training Center, and uh, since I'm in charge of those courses as well, I thought that uh, I'll try out how the Mac, Mac survives with my usage, and uh, uh, I haven't been that uh, successful with it. I've been running most, most of the time the boot camp Windows 8.1, and uh, uh, however, since the Mac doesn't have the TPM chip, I wanted to show you the virtual smart card, and that's why I have the old machine, which has the TPM chip on it. On this environment, the CA has been implemented, and uh, as you probably know, most of you, uh, the CA implementation has, has had four, uh, three steps already for quite a while. So even in 2012 R2, you have the first step of defining the CA policy in file. And that, that file, you can, for example, define the uh, setting load policy templates. So with that load policy templates false setting, you actually define that you don't want to distribute any certificates before you get everything ready. You can also 
define the alternate signature algorithm, you can change, uh, mod define the uh, renewal periods and so on. And then uh, for the cores, what we have done at least, we have actually used the graphical wizard to set up the uh, CS service or the uh, certificate service. But then for the production environment, of course, it would be better not to make any, any typing mistakes. So it's better to create the script and then uh, try out that script in, uh, in a pilot environment and then uh, use the same script and probably modify, modify the names. And of course, it's better if you don't have to even modify the names so that uh, you create the, the pilot environment with exactly the same names so that you can then move over and use exactly the same scripts on the production environment. And then uh, for, for 2008 and 2008 R2, uh, we had a, a script from the PKI product, product group block, and that one worked with uh, minor, minor changes. You, you, di you didn't have, uh, have to actually modify it. Uh, uh, now, now if I could only remember what was the, I think it was the, the expiry or the Renew renewal period that wasn't there in, in the uh, demos, demo block uh, or the demo script that was on the block. But then uh, now we are already in, in year 2013 and then uh, we have 2012 and 2012 R2 and those of course they have the PowerShell, PowerShell capabilities built in and integrated so we can use the PowerShell scripts, we don't have to use the VBS script uh, any, any longer. And as, as uh, for example, Active Directory, uh, domain services, the certificate service uh, setup is also now two stage. So you first install the binaries and then uh, you actually configure the, the service. And uh, uh, in this environment and today, I'm not going to uh, create a new CA. I have done it in, in, in advance. It wouldn't take that long to install the binaries. It, it probably takes a minute and then the configure the settings, it takes probably three seconds, so it's, it's very fast. But then when it comes to cores, I think it's better to use actually the, the wizard and the, the graphical wizard so that it's more intuitive and the, the students, they will see what they're actually doing and not just uh, creating the or copying the PowerShell script. What we actually do in our course is we, we create first the two-tier PKI with the graphical uh, wizards and then 2012 uh, PKI, uh, towards the end of the course, we created with, uh, with the PowerShell scripts. And then after, after you have set it up, then you have to, of course, define the uh, URLs, for example, for the certificate revocation list, distribution point, and uh, authority, authority information access uh, fields uh, where you can actually download the CA, CA certificate. One question that PKI, PKI is all about is uh, trust. So who do you trust? And uh, actually, the question is not so much about uh, who do you trust, but uh, who does your computer or application trust? Here in Finland, uh, actually, the I don't remember how, how it's translated in English, but the, the tri direct translation is the uh, uh, central crime police. They have actually been uh, warning us last week and this week in the television that uh, there are going to be some, uh, some threats for the, for the online banking systems. We have had some problems in the past and now they are, they are uh, warning us and they, they also, last, last night when I was driving home, I, I, they were actually saying that the, the banks uh, say that uh, if you haven't updated your machine, you are actually in charge uh, uh, and then uh, if, if, if you lose money, then, then they won't be paying you here. So, <clears throat> of course, you have to keep your, keep your machines and application up to date. And then uh, if you are using other applications than the ones that are integrated into the operating system, you have to, for example, keep, keep the trust also updates. So a good example we have on our, on our lab, lab environment, uh, I think most machines, they have a Firefox uh, web browser there and then of course web, oh, Firefox doesn't use the uh, built-in or the Windows infrastructure so, so then it won't, won't also update it automatically whereas uh, I have taken a screen capture here and uh, this is actually the demo that I have been using uh, already many years so uh, 
since we have the internet connectivity. I have actually uh, some anxiousness also for today because uh, uh, OP is actually my bank and I'm, I've, I've been in the uh, House of Representatives for the last 10 years and uh, they are going to actually announce today the, uh, the result of the election that took place a few weeks ago and that election was actually last uh, in, in our last parliamentary election we were trying the electronic election but it wasn't really successful and it was only, only being piloted and now this uh, uh, election for, for these uh, banks uh, there were I think uh, 60, 60 uh, local banks or, or regional banks here in Finland that the election took place a few weeks ago and uh, it was possible to, to vote also electronically through, through this, uh, as you see on the, on the right, upper right hand side there is a, a username and password and then uh, when you authenticate you have a username and password and then uh, actually there is uh, this kind of one, one time password uh, system that you have to use uh, afterwards. But I've been using this demo not to talk about the, only the bank but also to show, show that uh, it's uh, when, when you are standing here and demoing things, it's better to have uh, very little typing because you will make typing errors. And then uh, here I only typed op.fi and there is automatic uh, redirection to HTTPS. So when we have a look at the certificate, we see that uh, it's an extended validation certificate. It has been, uh, it has been uh, created and signed by VeriSign. And then we ha when we have a look at the uh, certificate details, we actually can see that there is, uh, there is uh, uh, one field for the CRL distribution point. It says there that uh, you can actually download the CRL from that URL. But I have also highlighted with this uh, that there is also on the author authority information access field you also have a field, uh, a field there for URL for OCSP, so this time, uh, this time there is a URL evsecure-ocspverisign.com. So you can actually verify the certificate and you don't have to do the certificate revocation check, you can, you can use the OCSP. I haven't been training the 2012 or 2012 uh, not, 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 uh, R2 courses uh, since they are not available yet, but then on our O courses we have been using uh, R2 as well. But then uh, uh, now I'm, I'm not sure whether you actually implement the OCSP on the mock courses at the moment. Do you remember? On our, on our PKI course we do implement the OCSP and then uh, yeah, but then on 2012, yeah, 412 has those uh, few few modules on AD services. Yeah. Okay. Uh, anyway, so OCSP. What I have been also demonstrating the, during the course is uh, now if I jump into the into the demo environment, and then uh, I, I jumped into the 2012 R2, and then open up. Uh, some group policy from there. We can see that uh, in this group policy, when you open up Windows settings, security settings and public key policies, you have this uh, certificate path validation settings and then there is this revocation tab and on the revocation tab you can actually define that uh, you would prefer CRL over OCSP. So when you have an operating system that has the crypto next generation, in other words, 2008 or Vista or newer, then they will prefer the OCSP if it's available. What would be the situation that you would actually check this uh, checkbox? Why would you use CRL checking over the OCSP? Have you come across uh, with such situation? What I have thought uh, would, would be one, one situation is that if you actually have implemented, you are going to implement your PKI and then uh, you, are, you are haven't been able or for some reason or other you are not going to implement the OCSP responder at the same time, then you could actually put the OCSP in the I, uh, authority information access field already 
so that the clients would know it already, so that uh, once you have the OCSP web responder ready, then you don't have to uh, uh, recreate all the certificates, because of, of, of course you cannot, you cannot, uh, cannot uh, modify the settings in the uh, published certificates, because they have been signed already. For this, uh, 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 this trust, trust thing, uh, the other thing that I've been demonstrating is uh, something that now I didn't look for for Finnish or English uh, site, but then I know from Finland, and Sami has been also teaching you some Finnish over these uh, different events. Uh, I will teach you one, one thing that uh, uh, ser server certificate is called Palvelin Varmenne. And this uh, server certificate, uh, we have one operator called Sonera, and Sonera is actually selling certificates also. And now, as you see, the, the URLs are still HTTP, there is no sign for certificates, but then uh, when I go one step further and I click that uh, I, want to, I want to order a SSL server certificate from Telia Sonera, then there is a transfer over to HTTPS, and then there is also a redirect to another page. And after a while, we should be able to see the page. Now there, is a, there was a redirection into the SSL, SSL uh, protected page. And then when we have a look at the, at the certificate, we will be able to see from here that it, it has been signed by Telia Sonera root CA. And what wasn't in... in uh, now I, I should have opened, but I, I missed in my demo script. Uh, I should have opened uh, cert uh, lm.msc. Uh, in our own environment, I have actually distributed uh, MMC, custom-made MMC called comcert.msc for all machines. Because I'm kind of uh, fed up already over the years I have created MMC and I have instructed our students to create uh, MMC so many times uh, with local machine certificate uh, stores. Uh, finally, Microsoft got uh, feedback and then uh, on 2012 and 8 they have the CERT LM, so it's CERT for local machines, local machine uh, certificate stores. And now, uh, after I opened the after I opened that Telia Sonera uh, server certificate purchase page. I actually got uh, uh, Telia Sonera root CA uh, into the trusted root certification authority store. And the evidence that this wasn't there, now, now we have actually on this machine, I, I installed it a few days ago, I have been browsing a little bit on the, on the web, and then uh, you see that we have 23 certificates as trusted at the moment. But just uh, to show that uh, uh, this was actually downloaded from Windows Update just now, if I open up, uh, I open up the first PowerShell, and from PowerShell, uh, I open up the Windows uh, Event Viewer, and then from there uh, we go and see the application log, and in the application log, you will actually see, or you would see, one thing that I recall now from last week. I showed the same demo there. Uh, <coughs> yesterday, when I, was, when I was practicing for this, this, this session, today's session, I was actually doing this demo on the 2008 R2. And on the 8 R2, you would have, have actually had uh, one event here the, in the application log. But on, on 2012 R2 uh, and uh, Windows 8.1, you don't get that event. So actually, uh, fortunately, I took the screen, screen capture uh, yesterday, so I, I see here that uh, there, there was a successful auto-update of third-party root certificate, Telia Sonora root CA version 1. And now when I look at the, uh, uh, this screen capture, the background actually shows that uh, it's, it's yellows, yellowish, so I'm pretty sure that I actually took it from 8.1. And now I'm wondering, why, why, didn't, uh, why didn't the event come up? One demo uh, that we, we, or one exercise that we do on our PKI courses is also to enable the CAPI, CAPI 2 logs. Has everybody, uh, or are you familiar with the CAPI 2, Crypto API 2 log? Not, not everybody. Uh, <coughs> because one thing that I have learned is that when you enable the CAPI 2 log, I will show it in, in a while, uh, 
if, if there are 10 students in the class and then there is an additional trainer, there are 11 of us, if we all enable that capital lock and then we browse to some uh, website that has uh, TLS or SSL uh, protected uh, website, web pages, so you will see HTTPS. Out of those 10 or 11 uh, of us, probably two or three won't have any events in the CAPI2 log straight away. And then that's, that's a good uh, time to have a coffee or, coffee or lunch break, because uh, after you come back, then it always works. But I, I actually, I, I even asked a few years back, uh, I think it was in 2008, I asked uh, from the product group that why there is a delay and how you can actually take away that delay because uh, it's uh, like, like this uh, demo effect that, that I had just now, it's kind of a uh, nuisance that uh, it doesn't work straight away all every time. How many of you have used uh, thisisert.com uh, slash help website? Has any of you used it? Sami has used it. Uh, <clears throat> so why don't I show you a brief demo of that website because it's, it might be useful and uh, uh, I'm also training Link. Uh, this week I have been training Link for, for four days and then uh, one, one uh, certificate related thing that I, I showed you during the last week's course or this week's course was also that uh, uh, when we implemented or we migrated in, in Sovelto environment from OCS to Link 2010, uh, I had uh, some, some contacts from other companies, the federated contacts, and after the migration, when we migrated the Edge server, uh, the, the presence of some contacts, some federated contacts became presence unknown. And then when I started to look for the, the reason for this, I actually learned that uh, on the Link Edge server, which is located there on the, on the edge of the internal network, on the event lock, there was an error that, uh, saying that the TLS session or TLS connection couldn't be established because of the trust. And then it was saying that the, what was the other party's uh, uh, FQDN. And the, with this tool, I actually opened up then uh, so I can now, now check, for example, for Sovelto, our, our uh, Edge server is zip.sovelto.fi, and then uh, the federated connections, they take place in uh, port 5061. And then uh, you can actually just click the check server, and then it shows you how actually, how this site, uh, what kind of certificate it has, what are the subject alternative names there, and then it also shows there on the lower part, it shows uh, what was the chain of the CEAs that was actually uh, issuing this certificate. So with this tool, I was able to pinpoint that uh, on, on the other Edge server uh, in, uh, in one organization, they had actually Entrust certificates. And the demo that I showed you just now actually downloaded the root certificate from Windows Update. But it doesn't, uh, the cryptographic services, it doesn't uh, download the intermediate CA certificates. But with this kind of tool, of course, other, other companies have these tools as well, but then this is a dash help, it's, it's pretty easy to remember. And then uh, one thing that uh, took place just a couple of months ago, actually Microsoft released the hotfix for older operating systems from 2000 and Vista onwards that enables you to download the trusted certificates and uh, trusted CA certificates into disconnected or offline environments. Has any of you used uh, this on, on earlier, earlier operating systems? This, this fix was actually incorporated into, into the Windows 8.1 and then 2012 R2. You don't have to do it any longer, but this is, this is um, something that is useful. What took place uh, last, or what happened actually last, Octo uh, last November? Well, it, it has something to do, Microsoft uh, actually released something that uh, caused some problems with server connections. Does anybody remember what, what happened last year? Just one year ago. Microsoft released one hotfix and that was actually targeted to both servers and also uh, both workstations and then uh, also server operating systems. 
and that fix actually uh, imported 350 uh, trusted CA, or, uh, CA certificates into the trusted root certification store. And what, what it caused, it caused uh, uh, different kind of issues. I actually, just a few months ago, I was helping one uh, organization with their link, and there was a problem with link uh, replication. Link, link didn't synchronize its settings from uh, one server to another. And I was kind of uh, getting already desperate at what, what could be causing this kind of problem. And we were trying to uh, use the link, uh, link uh, debugging tools and so on. And we couldn't figure out what was the causing the problem. And now over the last few years, uh, actually, I have uh, started to use two troubleshooting tools. They have become my favorites. One of them is Netstat, Netstat uh, space dash A-N-O. And then uh, you, can, you can find string sent because then you, you can locate uh, whether there are issues with firewalls. And I, ha I don't have it in this presentation, so if somebody didn't catch it, then uh, netstat and then dash A and O are the, are the parameters that I usually use. And then, uh, of course, you can, you can then uh, pipe it and use find string and what, what, which is the string that you look for, uppercase sin underscore sent. So this, this has become a very useful tool. You don't have to implement uh, any Wireshark or network monitor. You see straight away that uh, a TCP sin, was, sin packet was sent and it never received a reply. The other tool that has become a very useful tool for me is the CAPI2 logging. So what CAPI2 logging uh, would enable us to do, uh, it would show us if there are any problems with certificates or CRL checks. I put here a screen captures of the OCSP and also uh, the, the settings that, setting that I, I showed you from the, from the group policy. <coughs> the CRL checking, I have taken here three screen captures. This time I didn't use nets that I didn't use the CAPI2 logging. I actually created one website, and then uh, I used the Internet Explorer 7 and 8 on different operating systems. And I, I, I made it so that uh, on, on the server side, there was actually a, a web server, so it was IIS 8. And this IIS 8 server, <coughs> it had a certificate, and that certificate had the CDP, so the CRL distribution point, having three HTTP URLs. And none of these actually were existing anywhere. The DNS, DNS entries were there, but then I actually, what I did, I used the Fiddler tool, so on the, on the top I used the Fiddler version 2, and then uh, on Windows, actually, now I, I, re I see that uh, I should have put there, uh, I did copy, copy the text, and now you see that it's not correct. So on the, on the lower, lower screen captures, I was actually using Windows 8 and Internet Explorer 10. And on these operating systems, if you have implemented your CRL distribution points in such a way that they are not available, it causes delays. And of course, the delay can be reduced by, by, by modifying the GPO if you have uh, workstations or servers which, which are members of domain. Then, of course, if you, if you are outside of domain, then you can't use a group policy object. On the Windows 7 and Internet Explorer 8, it took around 17 seconds to open that web page. So it was trying to locate the CRLs and in the Internet Explorer, you don't have the strong CRL checking, which means that the Internet Explorer is trying to locate the CRL, but then it times out. On Windows 8 and Internet Explorer 10, it actually first starts to download, and what it starts to download, it actually starts to download the CTL for disallowed certificates. So that will take approximately according to Fiddler, it takes 12 seconds. Then it will start to locate the CRLs. On this environment, as you see, uh, uh, coming, coming uh, 
further and to the, to the future actually made things worse. So if it took, in Windows 7, it took 17 seconds to open that web page. The end user would wait for half a minute before the web page opened in Windows 8 and Internet Explorer 10. And this is something that really highlights the importance of having your URLs for CRLs correctly. Any questions so far? The next, next thing that I will show is the offline environment that we are facing with our, our courses and course environments. Because the CR veri verification doesn't work, it causes delays on, on both uh, opening uh, web pages and then even starting different applications. And uh, one option is of course to turn off CRL verification. How many of you are training Exchange? You probably remember that uh, in, in, was it cumulative update of Exchange 2007, that if you didn't uh, switch off the CRL checking and you did the uh, update in the offline environment, it took how long? One hour? Something. It took quite a while to update, it, even more than one hour to update uh, the uh, Exchange server. Then the other option that I was actually using on, on the, on the low, last uh, uh, demo here, I, I, I modified the default. So by default, the operating system is looking for the first CDP URL for 15 seconds, and then we'll, we'll spend 20 seconds altogether for all the CD, C, CDP or CRLs that are in those URLs. I modified on this one, it showed that uh, the first CRL is, is uh, looks for three seconds and then the whole list is uh, checked for four seconds and then altogether it took eight seconds to open so with this group policy you can definitely make things uh, happen faster. Then <coughs> option that I have been using in the past uh, manually, more manually than now, is to download and install the CRL manually. And then the steps for this option three are to enable the CAPI2 logging, then uh, look for event IDs 42, and then look for the URLs in those events. And the problem when, it, when, you, try, when you start doing this with PowerShell, the problem is that the, uh, these URLs are actually on the details tab. So it wasn't very easy. I actually spent quite a few hours yesterday. Uh, I, I thought that I, I will prepare this uh, script for this presentation and uh, I was able to do it but it took quite a while to, to create that it, it's actually shown on the next page. Uh, then you download those CRLs and then you one way or another distribute them into the uh, operating systems for those systems that uh, uh, seem to be a bit slow. And the, the script is shown here and then uh, I thought that I, I will also make it available on the Sovelto, Sovelto uh, block, so uh, you can actually download it from there. But what it what it took me to uh, create this? The first first thing is very easy. You just filter filter the event lock, capi two event lock based on the ID number. But then to get into the details tab, what I did I learned from the web that it's actually possible to transfer the uh, events so that or the convert the events to XMLs. XML files, and then from Excel, XML files you can actually find the detail. At this time, it's URL. So why don't we go and uh, have a look how this this might affect uh, some application? Of course, it depends on the applications. On this environment, I have the FIM FIM uh, certificate management. So we'll go into the demo environment, and in the demo environment, now we move over into the Server 04 and zero, Server 04 is actually 2008 R2 server. And what I have done, uh, why do we jump over several remote desktops is because uh, I actually modified it so that uh, this server doesn't have the default gateway, so I can't access it remotely. Now it's offline, it's within the same environment. Uh, I have already opened the uh, uh, event viewer. And event viewer, I have opened application services logs, Microsoft Windows, CAPI2 operational. By default, this lock is disabled. And this lock size is by default 
1028. I don't, re I don't fully understand why it's 1028 and not 1024. But usually I, I put it so that it's uh, 16 megabytes. It doesn't take the whole, whole uh, disk space if it's 16 megabytes and then, then I enable it. This time the application that we are using is called uh, FIM Certificate Management. So it's a web page, uh, web page uh, uh, application. And what I have done uh, before I left the office and came here to Hotel Presidente, as you see, I actually uh, did the ease reset to ensure that the application, web application is stopped. And now I start from the scratch and then uh, I also want to see how long it takes. So now if we could only make it a bit smaller, smaller and then uh, uh, take clock from somewhere I, I now use from the, from the host machine or my operating system, I, I make it so that uh, uh, I click the link now. So it was 35 seconds past. Guess how many events opening this application creates in the CAPI2 lock? How many? A lot. Would it be tens or dozens or hundreds or thousands? Opening, opening up one web page with HTTPS like that op.fi, it generates just over 100 events or, or something like 150 events. But now you see that uh, it has taken now 35 seconds and the web, web page should open any time now. At least in my test it took around 33 seconds. And then when we go and have a look, now, now we maximize this uh, machine and then uh, go and see the CAPI2 lock. We see that it says on the top that there are new events available. So I refresh the view and we see that there are 3,336 events created by opening this one application. And then if we filter this, uh, you will see that, or if we just browse through this, you see that there are a lot of errors. And these errors, when you go and have a look, uh, this event ID, ID uh, 42, it says reject revocation information. And when you go to details tab, you actually see that it was trying to download that one URL, but it wasn't able. So it's actually the one event before or after, it says there that the uh, revocation function was unable to check revocation because the revocation server was offline. So now it took 43 seconds and you can actually, uh, if, if you didn't have the clock available, uh, you can also see it from the, from the timestamps here. So the first event was 11.43.41 and then the last one uh, was uh, 44.17. Now I clear this lock and what I will do now, I will show you that uh, I have actually created created the group policy and then uh, in the meantime we can actually restart this machine. Uh, yes, so uh, <coughs> I will restart this machine and at the same time I will go and have a look at, at, the, at the group policy. So on this environment the group policy, group policy, there is uh, one group policy called C startup script and that C startup script what, what type of settings it has. It has other settings apart from not responding. Hopefully it will see, show it up or if it doesn't then uh, I will go straight away to the, to the uh, domain controller and open up it from there. And there, there uh, I actually have created it. So if we go we will see that there is a PowerShell script called copy crls.ps1. So what this script does, it copies from the server. I have actually downloaded those crls here. It copies these uh, crls into the intermediate store on the servers. So now, by now the server 4 should be already up. So let's have a look what, what happens there. So uh, one thing that I missed just now uh, was to show you the script. So if we go and have a look at the tools, I have the filter CAPI2 events 
and then I open, up, open it up with the integrated scripting environment and then I run this script and as a result, uh -huh. what's the problem there now? What does it say? Oh, oh, one thing. <laughs> yeah, I cleared the log. So, so there is there is no longer no longer the uh, CSV, but uh, uh, you can you can try this out later on on your own environment, and then uh, you you will get this uh, one file CSV file with all the URLs, and then with of course you can't download the URLs from the same offline machine, so you have to take the the file to another machine and use another script there. But now what has taken what has happened? Uh, we have actually with that one starter script, we have uh, imported these th three uh, CRLs into the intermediate certificate store into the certificate revocation list uh, folder. And now, <coughs> if I have a look, uh, let's, let's size again this uh, window so that we can see the time. And then uh, I open up again the Internet Explorer and then uh, click that certificate management now it was quarter two. In my previous test, it took around six seconds. So, so it's, a, it's a reduction from 43 seconds to around six seconds to start up this uh, application. And when we go and have a look now on the event lock, on the CAPI2 lock, we will see that the, uh, there shouldn't be any errors because if there were timeouts now you see that there are 3059 events and then if we maximize the window and then uh, filter the current lock based on the errors there shouldn't be any but then uh, you actually see let's have a look it says that there was some and this this one is actually you see also that it is it is the auth root stl uh, auth root stl dot cap and that one fix that I, I showed you on the previous slide would actually have enabled us to download this manually into this offline environment. But as you see, although this, this error uh, exists here, it, doesn't slow, it didn't slow down the startup of the application. Any questions so far? Let's go back to the presentation. So this was, this was the script. And then, uh, <coughs> then one thing that I learned pretty recently was about uh, domain controller certificates. Domain controller certificate template has been there since uh, Active Directory came along. In other words, Windows 2000. Domain controller certificate templates is such that if you make that uh, certificate template available in any of your CAs, all domain controllers fetch and download the domain controller certificate based on that template automatically. But then uh, uh, we are now already in version, version uh, server operating system version 2012 R2. We have in, the pa in, the, in this uh, path, we have also got uh, two new templates, domain controller authentication and Kerberos authentication. Kerberos authentication enables us to ensure that the, the clients can authenticate the key distribution center, in other words, domain controller based on server certificate. And this Kerberos authentication template uh, re, uh, con contains the required enhanced key usage. In order to deploy this Kerberos authentication uh, uh, certificate, what you have to do, you have to make it available. And the other thing that you have to do is to enable en auto enrollment for the domain controllers. Just uh, two weeks ago we actually we were uh, implementing a PKI for one company that had six domain controllers and once we made this uh, Kerberos authentication template available, they, the, the domain controllers had in the past they had actually retrieved uh, uh, certificates based on the domain controller uh, template but after we, we created the Kerberos authentication template and made it available it actually, within, within three minutes, all six domain controllers actually uh, issue, or, uh, they were issued a uh, uh, certificate based on the Kerberos authentication certificate. 
or, or the template. This uh, is very well documented on uh, some guy called Morgan Simonsen's uh, blog. I'm not sure uh, how, many, how many of you were familiar with this uh, issue or with these certificate templates. I guess probably not everybody knows. Uh, if, if the MCTs don't know, then uh, probably the, the IT professionals don't know about this either. I showed you just now uh, the third lm.msc. So that MMC console became available with 2012 and 2012 R2. What we actually missed with the new server manager, server manager is now a, a tool for managing uh, large quantities and large number of servers, and it's also a tool to monitor those servers. We actually lost the tool that had all these uh, PKI tools integrated into one place. But now what you can do is to create your own MMC console and then add enterprise PKI, uh, PKI view.msc and then the certificate templates and certification authority so that you will have them again in the same place unless you use PowerShell. And for PowerShell, now Server core is fully supported, so you don't have to have the uh, graphical user interface installed on the CA servers. You can have these uh, uh, RS, RSAT tools on some other uh, workstation or server. And then, uh, of course, you can use uh, PowerShell commands as well. There are altogether uh, a few dozens of uh, commands, and out of these, I have marked the ones that uh, were, um, were made available with 2000R2. So, for example, there is uh, the backup CA role service and restore CA role service. These are new PowerShell commands in server 2000R2. The tool that is not uh, perfectly documented, I would say, is the search util. It's, light, it's, it's, it's kind of Swiss tool for PKI. You can do amazing things with it. And unfortunately, there is not a definite docu documentation for this tool. There are actually, on, on, I think it was on my first or second slide, there was one URL for, for a reference library for PKI. There is some documentation on Microsoft uh, website for search util, but now they have again come up with uh, more than how many of uh, two, four, eight, six, eight, nine, nine new uh, parameters for that command. And as you see, there are three, three of them, verified CTL, sync with uh, Windows Update, and generate SSD from Windows Update. Those three parameters are so that uh, this new fix can be used with older operating systems, and then uh, uh, this new operating system have already these uh, parameters built in. I put here a few slides that I, I think are the most usable uh, and most valuable uh, in 2002 and 2000, uh, R2 and of course Windows 8 and 8.1. And then I hide the other, other three slides. Uh, you, you will have these uh, slides available. You can, you can see them and have a look at them. Of course, they are available also on the TechNet. In my opinion, the Certificate import wizard has caused some confusion for those people who are not so familiar with certificates. And now Microsoft has also heard that feedback and they also took action on this uh, feedback so that when you start importing, it actually asks that, hey, are you, bringing, are you trying to import it now onto the computer side or to the user side? So you don't, ha you don't have to anymore uh, try out and try to figure out why something doesn't work because you probably import it into the wrong side. And what I have uh, instructed our students to do is always not to use the automatic uh, certificate store uh, selection, but rather use it, uh, do it manually. The other thing that is even more useful is that no longer you have to talk about certificate templates uh, version 1, 2, and 3, because there is also a version number here. In the past, previous operating system had uh, one column showing that what is the minimum CA operating system version that you have to have in order to issue uh, certificates based on some certificate templates. Now on 2012 and 2000R2, you actually have a new column here, but we have been talking about versions 1, 2, 3, 
and now four as well. Uh, now they have been in tit uh, or titled as schema version for the templates. This is pretty useful not to cause any confusion. And now one thing that I didn't put, I, I think uh, everybody should know it already, that uh, on 2012 and 2012 are two because you have only standard, operate, uh, standard edition and data center edition, you can do everything uh, when it comes to PKI with both editions. You, you don't have to any longer think that, oh, I, I, I can't use standard edition now. The other thing that is very useful is that you have this compatibility uh, tab. And then you can say that, okay, I want to create such certificates that are usable also for Windows XP or or some other uh, uh, operating system version. This is pretty useful. Uh, we implemented one, one PK infrastructure uh, something like half a year ago for one company where they wanted to implement the elliptic curves. So they went as high as, as you can with 2012 and 2012 R2. They learned, we, we, I asked that, do you really want to go this high? Yes because they have older, older PKI that they can use to issue certificates for older operating systems and other devices in the network. But now we actually learned that uh, there, is, there will be uh, one uh, update for some Linux distribution only next spring that enables them to issue certificates from this new PKI. On 2012 R2, and Windows 8.1, uh, there are not many, not many changes. One of them is uh, related to the TPM chip, and it's, uh, it has got uh, one new tab uh, called Key Attestation, so you can actually define how strong the authentication of a user has to be before he, can, he or she can actually uh, request for this uh, or, or certificate based on this template. And one thing that I also learned when I was preparing for this uh, demos, uh, how many times have you had to create a new certificate request after learning that there was something wrong with the network? Or there was, uh, for example, TMG and you had this uh, DCOM uh, restriction there. Now there's a retry, retry button there, so you don't, you don't have to fill in all the details any longer. It's already there, built in. And then to, to finish off my presentation, uh, I have a few, few things to say about virtual smart card. How many of you have created or implemented any version so far with the virtual smart card? What's your uh, opinion? Is it useful? One thing that if I had had more time, so uh, fortunately our customers keep us busy uh, conducting courses. If I had had more time, I would have actually liked to show you uh, how to create this virtual smart card with Surface RT. So that's something that is now available, but unfortunately I didn't have uh, such luxury this time. Uh, I did actually for this machine use this command TPM SVC manager. I created a new virtual smart card reader and a, a virtual smart card, and then uh, I, I downloaded or issued a smart card certificate to the card. And then uh, I took a few screen captures from the direct access so that if you want to uh, define that you have to have strong authentication for the user tunnel for the direct or infrastructure tunnel for direct access, you can actually uh, use the virtual smart card so that when, when the user wants to access some infrastructure servers and their services, you have to fill in the pin code. My opinion is, my opinion is that uh, even now with v Windows 2000, uh, 2000, uh, Server 2012 R2 and uh, 8.1, uh, the virtual smart card is not good enough enterprise-wide uh, for deployment, for enterprise-wide deployment on its own. So you basically have to go for uh, some third-party solution and put it on top of the operating system so that you can actually manage the whole life cycle of certificates with virtual smart cards. So it's, it's one step forward, but it's still not quite uh, far, far enough. For this presentation, I created that 2012 uh, PKI infrastructure so that it's, it's very secure. It's using elliptic curve algorithms, and I also learned that I can't use those certificates on the virtual smart card. So then I had to create a, a new template with, uh, with legacy CSP cryptocurrency service provider, and then I was able to uh, issue and uh, get a certificate for logon and also for, for direct access. 
if this wasn't deep enough, I hope it was. I, I actually asked Sami to update uh, the level from 300 to 400 uh, during this week. Uh, you can actually go Latvia. Has any of you seen this, this uh, Vadim's blog? Have you ever figured that why, if I show you one last demo uh, on this environment, what I have done also, uh, if I go to server 13, and I saw from here uh, there is uh, this two-tire two -tire, uh, PKI hierarchy. Uh, you can see that at the end of the demo root CA there is version 3.0. On demo issuing CA there is version 1.1. What do, what do those numbers indicate? They indicate that uh, these CA, uh, CA certificates have been renewed. And I haven't seen anywhere else the des description and the definitive explanation of what, what are those numbers and how, do, how are they actually created. And I have put here a link, uh, which one is it now? Root CA certificate renewal. There, this uh, Vadims actually shows you uh, and explains you how it, it actually done. And he, uh, based on these articles, I'm pretty sure he also uh, was awarded the MVP, uh, I think, last year or the year before. But he's, he's very, very, very uh, knowledge-wise uh, about uh, PKI. This concludes my presentation. Any questions? George. TPM attestation, no, I didn't have time so far. Yeah, I'm wondering if uh, and you did try. No, but we've been talking about it so much that I was sure someone would ask. You. <laughs> because I, I think it's also, it, it's again something that uh, they haven't provided uh, good, good uh, guidance uh, how to implement it yet. Anyway, I over... <laughs> I'm, I'm over my time already by, uh, by more than 10 minutes, so I think we will have to finish and then uh, we'll, we'll break out for lunch. Thank you very much for the sponsor. Thank you.